So what's this buzz around Tesla entering the Indian electric vehicle market? There's a lot of talk, a lot of uh, discussion in the media about um, Tesla um, bringing in basically a, a gigafactory, one of those massive gigafactories that Tesla has uh, in China, in the United States, and now in Berlin, which is the latest. There's also talk of uh, Tesla bringing uh, its technology of battery manufacturing to India, setting up a battery manufacturing plant. Uh, there's a lot of buzz about uh, raw material sourcing, but is it what it appears to be on the surface? Is Tesla going to dominate and transform um, the Indian electric vehicle market, just like it has in the United States and in Europe? Well, here to discuss this with me today is Dipesh Rathor. He's a mobility futurist and uh, handles product strategy at Ola Electric, which, by the way, is one of India's biggest and most important EV players. Welcome, Dipesh. It's great to have you on Over the Horizon. Thank you, Rajan. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, the pleasure is all mine. I look forward to the discussion. So if you can begin by telling our viewers a bit about what exactly uh, a mobility futurist does um, and, what, and also what's... What is your involvement with Ola Electric and how do you see the future with uh, help Ola Electric see the future of uh, EV mobility in India? Sure. Uh, so I believe with the advent of electric mobility, uh, it is sort of a resetting of mobility in uh, everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. It also means that, that the, the hundreds of years of legacies that have been created by brands suddenly don't stand for much because uh, uh, electric mobility just offers everyone the the chance to leapfrog over others through uh, uh, let's say investing and working on technology that would be more relevant in the future so i would say there there is a big shift happening across the world in mobility from dinosaurs to electric and uh, me as a futurist i try to look into the future and say that not only uh, you know the engine or let's say the uh, the prime mover of cars and two wheelers is going to change what is also going to change is how we are going to use the vehicles how we're going to own the vehicles how we're going to uh, how brands are going to support us with the vehicles because the entire ecosystem will have to change with electric mobility and yeah, so you know, as a futurist, I just try to look into the future and see, okay, maybe this is the right picture. And I suppose this would uh, also include autonomy. It would. Uh, not today, but somewhere in the future. And maybe not as relevant for India, but very relevant for uh, about 100 odd countries in the world where uh, the demographics don't support uh, you know, people being behind the wheel. You know, as population is growing old, uh, somewhere in the future, technology will have to replace humans. And you can already see companies experimenting with humanoids, uh, a lot of autonomy happening. Uh, when we, you know, uh, we are still in the experimental phases, apart from a couple of cities, you know, there's no licenses being given for autonomous vehicles. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a start, it's a, it's a very good start. and. Uh, Again, I, I reiterate that maybe India won't need that in a hurry. We have, uh, thankfully, a lot of people and a lot of young people. Uh, yeah. But uh, we, we clearly have the demographic advantage. Definitely. There's no we doubt have about that. Advantage and, uh, Perhaps even more than China. Absolutely, it is. But uh, in another way, I see autonomy. Uh, autonomy being beneficial to a country like India is to uh, uh, make the route safer. You know, that's something that right. we can really do with, yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I see and, uh, autonomy. Uh, electric. Yeah, carry on, carry on, sorry. Yeah, I see autonomy is uh, replacing humans or human intervention in the Western markets. In India, I see it as supporting uh, the human input. Okay. And um, Ola Electric, which is a huge player in the Indian EV market, um, of course, this is we're talking about two wheelers and three wheelers so far, but um, 
is still a very important uh, segment of the total EV market in India. Yeah, well, uh, we are the biggest uh, two-wheeler, electric two-wheeler manufacturer in India. Uh, as of today, we account for about 40% of all uh, electric two-wheelers on the road. Uh, we also lead in terms of technology and in terms of, I would say, design and engineering. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a good foundation to build on in the future. And where does that building on lead you? Does it lead you to four wheelers? Does it lead you to mass transit systems, vehicles, trucks, perhaps? Uh, and a lot of that is classified, definitely. I cannot talk about that. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but why limit? You know, uh, you know, I've got a source of energy. I, uh, you know, uh, I, as in all electric, is perhaps the only uh, automotive manufacturer who is doing the back end integration that is very much needed in electric mobility. We are yeah. setting up our own uh, cell manufacturing. It will come online in a few months. Mm. So when when I'm making the most audacious investment in the automotive industry, why would I limit myself to any form factor? And as I said, you know, at the very start, it's, it's uh, you know, I call myself as a futurist because the future is different from what we are looking at present. So I won't yeah. see that today we are doing scooters and tomorrow we'll do motorcycles. Maybe the world will change. Maybe there is a different shape altogether of mobility that we are yet to explore and we are on the journey along with our competition to explore. Mm. All right, so let's let's turn our focus to all this buzz around uh, Tesla's entry to India. Uh, so far, we seem to have got a sense that this major global uh, EV behemoth, uh, this massive um, transformer of uh, the automobile industry around the world, really. And that's what Elon Musk and Tesla Week uh, have essentially done uh, over the past uh, decade and more. Their coming to India is not without its complications. It's not without its caveats. Uh, the Indian government seems to be very keen on localizing the entire raw material supply chain, the manufacturing supply chain. Um, there's a lot of conscious effort to ensure that the subsidies that the Chinese government provides to its EV manufacturers in China does not impact the Indian market, does not impact the Indian uh, manufacturing ecosystem, the Indian players. So it seems that it's not going to be a free ride for Elon Musk in India, right? Yeah, I agree on that. Uh, see, uh, I would look at it this way, that the Indian government also realizes that electric mobility is the future. And uh, our neighbor to the north, China, has made a huge investment and has global leadership in electric mobility. Unfortunately, the world is dependent on China for electric mobility, like it is dependent uh, to a large extent on the U.S. for the supply of uh, chips. Uh, right. The same uh, sort of holds true for China uh, being responsible for most of the lithium ion supply chain. And that is something that we don't want to carry on as a legacy burden on us. You know, we don't have the, the best relationship with China. And, uh, yeah. well, business is good with China. And uh, it's one of the biggest trading partners that India has. But that is during peacetime. With the geopolitics that it is, uh, I am all with the Indian government that you need to insulate yourself and you need to create your own ecosystem. And uh, Tesla is the biggest brand in electric mobility. Uh, I think by, uh, you know, in a way, not allowing uh, Chinese manufacturers to grow big in India and by sort of giving Tesla the character very much needed, the Indian government is doing a shrewd thing by, uh, you know, enabling the ecosystem in India to grow, especially at the back end. Uh, Tesla's entry would be a big shot in the arm for the ecosystem. Yeah. But there's also the back end and a very important part of the back end that you mentioned is battery manufacturing raw materials. Um, it is a polluting industry, uh, and which is one of the main reasons why the Chinese government, uh, why China has such an upper hand because of the Chinese government can just look the other way or just massively sub subsidize um, these industries, which I perhaps 
may raise a lot of questions in India as far as uh, the ecology goes. Um, but that's something I guess we'll have to wait and watch. Um, the fact does matter that India is definitely one of the biggest growing EV markets and which is why Elon and Tesla are so keen on coming in. The government has been doing a lot. So it's really encouraging to see that. But um, is it going to be a cakewalk? I mean, you have domestic players uh, in India. Uh, you've got the likes of um, Tata. You've got the likes of um, Mahindra. Uh, in 2017, I remember I bought the Mahindra Electric E2O Plus. Um, and the amount of interest that that would generate, that car would generate, every time I took it out onto the road was fantastic. It was phenomenal. So the Indian consumer is very aware, but also very price and value sensitive. So given the fact that you already have a lot of Indian players in the EV market and a lot of foreign players as well, including BYD, uh, do you think it's going to be a cakewalk for Tesla? Are they going to replicate their success and transform the Indian EV market? Or are they going to get hammered by the Indian players to begin with? Raden, I would be very disappointed if uh, it was a cakewalk for Tesla. Uh, India is a lucrative market. I want uh, good brands who do a lot of hard work to succeed in the market. Uh, but uh, healthy competition... In, in our case, heavy competition, also a domestic competition, is always a good thing. Tesla currently, if I look at the portfolio, it doesn't have anything substantial to offer in India. Uh, they are working on, uh, if I go by news reports, they are working on a Model 2, which would be priced yeah. much lower. $25,000 car. Yeah, that's what the news reports say. And uh, yeah. I let's go by that figure. That... Yeah. Uh, uh, that amounts to about 20 lakh rupees, which is yeah. in the ballpark of what an Exxon EV or uh, the Mahindra XUV right. 4 double plus. Uh, right. At the same time, I have not seen the Tesla Model 2. I don't think anyone has seen the Tesla Model 2. Uh, yeah. I don't know what the value proposition is. Okay. Uh, and uh, we should remember that you know uh, Tesla is a top one percent brand for the top one percent of India. Uh, beyond that, Tata and Mahindra are huge brands. They are yeah. they know the pulse of the market. They are, they are very very strong domestic players who have you know in their own way significant have been significantly investing in uh, electric mobility related technology. You know we know both Tata and Mahindra have got formidable pipeline products coming. So. Uh, yeah, Tesla is a strong play, but uh, there would be a good competition, and that is very good for the customer. That is very good for the ecosystem. Uh, I drive uh, Nexon EV on a daily basis, and uh, it's not the perfect EV uh, or, or the perfect car, but I find it as a very good, uh, let's say, the first step in electric mobility. Uh, it's a it's a commendable first step, and uh, you know, if the industry builds on from here. I think it's beneficial for everyone. So um, as we've seen in China, Tesla has done a lot to, in, by offering some very cutting edge and very relentless competition to the local Chinese players. Uh, and in the past couple of months, especially in cost cutting and really uh, undercutting the Chinese uh, EV makers on their own ground, on their own turf. Um, how do you see Tesla playing a transformative role uh, through its competition, through its uh, technological innovations and a frenetic pace of technological innovation, cost cutting, and just vertical integration? How, what sort of an impact do you, do you see that having on the Indian players like uh, Tata or Mahindra or Hyundai or even Suzuki? I think everyone learns a lot from the market leader, especially if the market leader is also the technology leader. Uh, in case of Tesla, they their cell format, for example, whatever they came out for 680, uh, that is something that provides companies a benefit. Uh, and there's a strong benefit uh, and that everyone else is seeing. And so everyone would be basing their uh, uh, batteries in the future on 4680s. 
Uh, then the next is the Giga Casting. And when Tesla came out with the Giga Casting technology, and it's not something that didn't exist in the world, but it's like taking something that already exists and I can make it better and significantly better. And uh, uh, you know, taking the technology from the technology stage to uh, industrialization stage, that is what Tesla does beautifully. And uh, uh, and as a result, now today everyone is talking of Giga Castings as uh, you know uh, as something of a tool that will reduce uh, uh, manufacturing com complexity. You know, one thing we should be aware is that uh, what electric mobility does is that it democratizes a lot. What True. Uh, so if you have a battery and a motor, and a lot of us have batteries and motors, uh, what you can do with the battery and motor is very limited in scope. Uh, there is a glass ceiling to how much battery you can pack within a car or any SUV or any platform or two-wheeler mm. or anything that is okay, because it is constrained by the physical space. There is a limit to how much motor I can pack, You know what uh, motor I can create because uh, that is uh, defined by my uh, product cost. Right. Uh, Unlike an ICE engine where my engine was known for being smooth or harsh or uh, in a long lasting or not long lasting, you know, there were different characteristics. Like Toyota engines were known for running for a lot of kilometers. Yeah. BMW engines generations. Were... They handed Gener down two generations. <laughs> exactly. So the BMW engine was different from a Suzuki engine, which was difficult, different right. from a Honda engine. And, and all of them were good in different ways. Unfortunately, or fortunately, all of that becomes a level playing field to a large extent. And the key differentiator then becomes uh, design styling, uh, mechanical engineering to some extent, uh, packaging and, uh, and electronics. And uh, Tesla has leadership in some of them. And that's a very, uh, that's a very significant leadership that they have. And uh, I think the the rest of the industry can learn from that, and uh, you know, once once you start learning, uh, there would be a time when you would also start competing. Yeah, but um, do you do you see a, a future where um, Indian um, OEMs would perhaps license some of the technology, license uh, or even purchase batteries from Tesla? And we're not even talking about. <laughs> The, the the Tesla charging network yet we'll get that to, get to that later but let's just talk about manufacturing do you do you see um, licensing of technology batteries etc from Tesla by Indian OEMs you know one of the other things that happens with electric mobility because of the democratization is a commoditization uh, so again you know uh, I would create my own battery I would create my own motor. Uh, because my margins depend, and, and that would be true for any brand, be it Indian or Chinese, that uh, mm. my margins would significantly depend on how much I can bring in-house and how much I have to outsource. You know, If I'm giving away some of my margins to Tesla, then uh, my whole profitability becomes challenged. Okay, And that would be true for, and, and if I look at the existing players, uh, be it Tata or Mahindra or uh, or Maruti, or Hyundai, Kia, or any of the other significant players, I think everyone is investing significantly in creating these uh, capacities to uh, to develop and design batteries and powertrains. I don't see any reason why someone should be buying from Tesla if at all Tesla has the spare capacity. Hmm. Interesting. So then, how do you how how do the likes of Tata and Mahindra bridge that huge technological divide or the gap between where Tesla is and where they are, not only in terms of battery, but also just the manufacturing and the production line. There is a learning that is continuously happening. And uh, remember, India is also a very challenging market. Tesla globally competes with a BMW or a Mercedes in terms of pricing. And so even if you bring a small Tesla, uh, that $25,000 is a very challenging price. Remember the Model 3 was advertised at $35,000 and it's right. nowhere close to that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, it shouldn't be the case, but simply that battery prices have not been falling that fast that everyone thought they would be. 
the amount of technology and electronics that and the compute power that is needed in a car has just gone up significantly and uh, because of that i just don't you know when you are coming from the top down which is in the case of tesla is true that you know i, I already make uh, cars of hundred thousand dollars now i have to make twenty five thousand dollar car that twenty five thousand dollar car may not necessarily uh, carry all the technologies that uh, that are packed in the hundred thousand car sure uh, and uh, remember everyone you know one of the other things that uh, let's say trend that is there in the global industry in the last uh, i would say decade and a half that i've observed is that uh talent is uh, is global in nature uh so True. i've seen I've seen uh, China-based players having design centers in Europe and engineering centers in Germany and software centers in the Silicon Valley and the purchasing operations in China and they've been delivering top class cars. Even if the generation one of the car is something where the European automotive journalists can point fingers at and say that it's not as good as a Mercedes, the generation two would be. And it's, uh, it's a learning that they have gone gone for. Same goes with Tesla and the Indian comparison, I think, uh, with, and as I said, you know, uh, the, the current crop of small SUVs that Tata Mahindra, they built to a price, uh, the generation two would be better. I, I can look at the new, the, let's say the, the facelifted Texon and it looks just better than the, the old one. Uh, and the same would be true for all the new SUVs and uh, cars that Mahindra and Tata have planned on the electric. Platform. So I think with every generation, there would be a significant uh, you know, narrowing of the gap or any advantage that Tesla uh, sort of uh, enjoys. Uh, and as I said, you know, India is a very value conscious market. When you start providing value, a lot of the, uh, the frothy technology has to be removed anyways. Yeah. And uh, speaking of which, uh, one of the, my... Uh, the members of my college alma mater, Sakit Mehrotra, has a blog, Beta to Alpha, on Substack. For those of you watching, you should definitely go and subscribe. He's got some very interesting breakdowns on uh, his personal experience with the Tata Nexon. Um, so this is Beta to Alpha by Sakit Mehrotra. Check it out. Subscribe. Um, he's got he's, he's got some very interesting um, breakdowns and, and numbers there. So, okay, let's, let's kind of... Um, Look at the Indian market as a whole now, Dipesh. Um, we began by putting a pin uh, on the board and saying, okay, this is the Indian market. It's more, it's very different from the US or the European market. Perhaps the only similarity that you can find to any market would be that of China, right? Uh, you've got a lot of uh, two wheelers and three wheelers in China. You've got a lot of local EV manufacturers, players. Um, the vast majority, uh, of EVs in India by number and even kilowatt hours is two wheelers and three wheelers. Am I right? And Ola is the number one there. Yes, you're right. There's a lot of three wheelers, a lot of two wheelers, some cars. Yeah. As some well. cars. Yeah. 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 So is this going to be the defining characteristic of the uh, Indian market overall in the next 10 years? Uh, it would change, but let's put it this way. See, there are 4 million uh, cars being sold in India. I'm just taking rough numbers. I haven't looked mm -hmm. at the data recently, but uh, let's say there's 4 million cars and about 18 million two wheelers being sold. Uh, and uh, 4 million can easily be divided into, say, about 2.5 million of uh, very value conscious customers and 1.5 million of customers who see, uh, who want more features. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, while for two wheelers, that 18 million roughly divides into about 15 million who are uh, buying scooters and motorcycles just for commuting. And for them, uh, the most important things are uh, uh, the price, the the running cost. So we call it combined as the total cost of ownership, TCO. And right. this thing is, uh, uh, is uh, the dependability. Okay. And in both cases, the electric uh, options just provide much more value for money. You know, the electric scooter uh, does not uh, require that much maintenance as uh, mm. one running on uh, internal combustion engines. Yeah. Uh, 
it provides much more value for money. So let's put it this way, a four unit charge on my S1 Pro will give you at least 150 kilometers on the road, which means that in eight rupees, I would be roughly doing about 37, 38 kilometers. That's a terrific value for money. It's like uh, what, five rupee, uh, sorry, five kilometers for a rupee, 20 pesa per kilometer. Instead, if I was fueling it with uh, petrol, uh, the competition uh, petrol scooter gives me about uh, a, a range of uh, a mileage of about 50 kilometers to a liter, which is two rupees per kilometer. So it's 10 times more, really. I save yeah. roughly one rupee 80 pesa per every kilometer yeah. that I run. Yeah, okay. that's, that's and, pretty much my personal experience also with the um the mahindra e2 plus in 2017. i mean i i bought that car essentially to do school runs twice a day for my mm -hmm. daughter and i I, just, I don't recollect off the top of my head just how much petrol costs per liter in those days but the rough calculation was that just the school runs in a petrol car would have cost me about twenty three thousand rupees plus which was about uh, maybe about four hundred dollars, three fifty, four hundred dollars equivalent then, and using the electric vehicle, the E two O plus brought my entire monthly use price down to about under two thousand rupees, which was just crazy. It was phenomenal, and it was then immediately that I recognized the transformative power of electric vehicles, and I'm sure this is something that the average Indian consumer is well aware of, as you just pointed out. And 150 kilometers on a single charge for your Ola S1, uh, your electric bike, electric two-wheeler, is, I mean, if you charge it, you, you, I don't know if there is a scenario within any city in India that you top up your, your two-wheeler to its full charge and you're not left with, at the end of the day, a phenomenal amount of kilometers still to go. Yeah, well, when we were designing the S1 Pro and uh, later on uh, the S1 here, we did extensive studies on the usage pattern of scooters. Uh, you know, customerism, and we have to take into account while designing any product. And we uh, we realized that the customer spends, a uh, typical scooter customer uh, travels about 30 to 35 kilometers a day. Beyond that, it doesn't run, you know, for any scooter. Yeah. And these are like, you know, long-lived high scooters. We took mileage readings, we took odometer readings and checked that, okay, how much have you traveled in the last three years or four years? And the the, the, the result was always the same, you know, 30, maximum 40 in case of a lot, unless you are in the delivery business and then you are doing much more, but then that's a commercial use of the scooter. On a personal use basis, 35, 40 kilometers was okay. And so we design, you know, the, the way I look at things is that I want to give the customer the one plus one plus one. Uh, so I've got one uh, day of charge, another day of charge if I get lazy and I did not charge overnight. And the third day of charge to give him the peace of mind that, yeah, you know, irrespective of whatever happens, he's got enough kilometers. And we overshot that as well. So, you know, that's why when we came up with uh, the S1X, we are also offering a three kilowatt our battery, which uh, brings the range down to about 100. But even with that, uh, I can easily do the one plus one plus one, uh, you know, principle that we follow. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think uh, with scooters, at least we are very sure that uh, the range is much more uh, needed. Absolutely. And um, I just want to reference here this article by Associated Press, and I'm quoting directly from it, where it says, uh, more than 90% of India's 2.3 million electric vehicles are the cheaper and more popular two or three wheelers, as you just heard the page say. It's motorbikes, scooters, rickshaws, uh, which is, by the way, a, a big uh, mass transit, a big uh, part of our mass transit systems or public transport systems uh, in cities, both small and uh, big across India. And over half of India's three wheeler registrations in 2022 were electric. So that just goes to show you how differentiated the Indian market is. But let's talk about capital costs, Dipesh. They're very high. Um, you have a 
uh, a technological ecosystem where constant innovation is is making a lot of technologies and uh, obsolete very very uh, quickly you also have at least as, as far as cars are concerned um, you still have people who are sitting on the fence and you know it's also a very characteristic of the indian consumer that perhaps i'm going to wait a bit and see what new technology comes on the horizon and you know they'll they kind of put off for purchase so given the high capital cost given the high rate of uh, technology obsolescence how do you see oems approaching this uh, this uh, market system you know uh if I look at uh, let's say ICE mobility, it has gone through uh, 120 years of evolution. Uh, the first motorcycles started coming uh, in the early 1900s, the late 1800s, the early 1900s, and uh, same for the car as well. So it has gone through about a 125 years of evolution, both of them, and uh, to reach where they are right now, the engines have become better. The you know. The, the cars do much more things than uh, you know uh, yeah sure electric mobility in comparison is not that old uh, it's just uh, you know uh, and uh, well let's say the battery and motor have been around for a long time but it's only recently that people have started putting them in automotive shells and uh, started experimenting with what we can do and uh, what is the possibility with that okay. so yeah going with that we are in the early stages of evolution uh, the capital costs are or are high at the same time, I'd like to point out, Royden, is that uh, there are, you know, like when we started with engines, there's not one type of engine. Uh, yeah. from single cylinder to 12 and 16 cylinder, we have seen them all, we've done them all. Even within that, they, we have done petrol, diesel, LPG, CNG, uh, mixed fuel, all sorts of things in that. Companies like Mazda have done rotary engines. Okay, uh, we have done various thermodynamic cycles in engines. So we have experimented the hell out of engines, yeah. and uh, not all manufacturers have seen eye to eye on uh, what is. You know, no one agrees. If if my R and D starts agreeing with the competition R and D, then we both. <laughs> then, yeah, then we both stop growing. You know, the, what yeah. are we working on? If we have, might as well you know move to the same building and uh, just co batch things. So. When I start developing a motor, my motor might be different from what my competition is working on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I'm right and he's wrong, uh, or he's right and I'm wrong. We more I mean, eventually the market decides who's right and who's wrong. No, in this case, it's much more complex, right? And it may be that both of us are right. And both of us will provide different benefits. You know, if I'm a designer which yeah. uses less magnets, but mm -hmm. has a technology that will only uh, fruitify in, say, 10 years' time, my competition may be working on something at much more grassroots level and I may use more magnets, but it's fine. His motor might be ready in the next six months. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we are, we are really exploring right now uh, in developing new technologies, a lot of promising things uh, happening. Uh, you know, uh, same goes with battery technology. We are constantly experimenting with uh, chemistries. And yeah. uh, I will I will not even you know put my neck out and say that uh, LFP is better than MC or vice versa or there is uh, mm -hmm. there are more promising technologies solid state batteries or sodium ion or whatever may yeah, work. Yeah, salt batteries which yeah. So it's but I uh, think I think yeah. at scale you only have I mean a, a very few uh, battery chemistry combinations that so far have reached uh, have been successfully uh, manufactured at scale and the biggest hurdle is taking a technology to scale right so where do you see innovation in battery technology chemistry in india i think that is one area where we are uh, we are uh, not too far behind the world you know as i said one of the recent things that i've observed in the last less of one and a half decades so let's not call it recent uh, is that uh, Talent is global in nature. Okay, mm. so the let's say the the people who would have designed batteries in the West or in China would also be happy to do so for an Indian manufacturer, you know, be it a Korean or a Chinese or a Taiwanese or a German or a Europe or any other nationality or an American. Uh, I have seen people moving around. There's much more global movement of talent happening, and uh, mm. with talent comes knowledge, and so. Uh, 
you know, I think we are gone past the days when Italy was known for design and Germany was known for engineering and Japan for electronics. I think those days are past. Uh, you're already seeing the first crop of pro products from uh, companies who are not based out of these markets and uh, they're doing uh, much more. I would again put my neck out and say that uh, it, gone are the days of, uh, you know, brands with 100 years legacies. Uh, Legacy is is a luxury that some of uh, the brands have, not everyone else has. But uh, uh, I think uh, China has sort of shown the way that creating a luxury brand in EVs is much easier than everyone thought. So be it a Zeker or a Link Co or a, one of the other, there's probably 20 of them around in China. Uh, it's, uh, I think they, their fit and finish and technology and performance matches anything that the Germans or the Americans are putting out. And, and in a way, in many ways, actually, the Germans and Americans have been following the trend here than setting it. So it's a, it's a very, I would say, it's very interesting times uh, mm. for someone like me uh, who, enjoys yeah, for the, sure. <laughs> who enjoys the game. At the same time, mm. it's very early to say that uh, uh, you know this would work and this would not work i think a lot of them will work in own uh, in very different ways uh, and that that is true for like battery chemistries as well uh, battery uh, you know the cell formats be it cylindrical or uh, prismatic or power cells a lot of them will have usage uh, and it a lot depends on you know what your r and d department your engineering department is familiar and comfortable with so uh, yeah, let's let's put it this way. Today, uh, uh, it's very interesting times, and we are exploring the future. Let's talk about government support, subsidies. Um, I mean, across across the value chain, um, and it's not just raw material sourcing, not only just processing, battery manufacturing, or assembly. Um, even the entire car manufacturing process. Is the government doing enough? I mean, uh, I know there's a lot of bonhomie between uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Elon Musk, and Musk seems to be quite uh, taken by uh, Modi and uh, what he's trying to do in terms of encouraging um, the entire EV ecosystem in India. But we've also seen <laughs> the mess that's uh, that's taken place with the uh, the fame to uh, subsidy. That's kind of, dare I say, burnt a few bridges between the government and EV manufacturers. I think the government has been extremely supportive. Remember, we are a developing country. We have uh, very limited resources to support any industry push. And, uh, you know, normally the government, when it's doing a legislative push, uh, it's, a, it's a very tight rope to walk. Uh, Remember all the ice manufacturers who, who exist till date, uh, they have invested... Uh, a huge amount of billions and billions of dollars in setting up their factories. They give employment to a few million people, and uh, that's, a, that's a very valuable part of the manufacturing economy. Yes. You just can't one day come with a legislative hammer and say that, yeah, I'm going to give, uh, I want to make, let's say, EVs free for all, and I want the country to just move to EVs. Yeah. Well, maybe that's, that's a nice wish list to have, but I would rather have it move at a natural pace. Let the customer decide yeah. that. I can support yeah. probably, but uh, uh, by supporting, I also have to give people, uh, in, in this case, brands and companies, the opportunity that you know technology is moving. Now is your time to move, and everyone does, you know, because businesses follow technology that way. Uh, coming to uh, what you were talking about earlier, what fame subsidy by the government, I think fame one was pretty bad. I, don't think it was thought through. Uh, frankly, I don't even remember much of it, but it was mostly uh, supporting the wrong people. Uh, I think it was supporting more the trader community who were importing kits from China and uh, sort of assembling it. Uh, you were surprised that electric mobility in the two-wheeler business has been around for the last 15 years. Uh, more than that, actually, I've seen, I've seen the first electric scooters on Indian roads about 15 years back, and these were poorly made Chinese kits, uh, didn't last, right. were powered by lead acid batteries. So, you know, obsolete mm. technology, not really yeah, highly polluting, highly polluting, not promising really anything at all. And uh, they were they were enjoying everything, you know, 
getting cheap sourcing from China, not putting their uh, uh, you know skin in the game. You are if you're a trader, all you need is a small warehouse to assemble these things, and uh, not investing in engineering or R and D or uh, productionizing as in you know localizing things. So Fame Two, uh, sorry, Fame One was a disaster. I think Fame Two was decently thought through. When the government started linking, uh, you know, uh, the subsidy to the battery capacity, and then to uh, you know the localization, and there were certain, you know, uh, there were a lot of fine prints in Fame Two, which linked you getting the subsidy on localization. I think the only problem that I saw in Fame Two for was that for many many quarters. The government kept on rewarding people uh, without uh, doing proper audits. You know, so if someone said that, yeah, my my supply chain is localized, that I'm and I'm adhering yeah. to Fame Two, the government took them at face value. It was only after towards the end of Fame Two when they did the audit and then they they caught a few players that who were still working as you know Chinese importers and saying, and then the excuse was you know. Uh, not very valid that you know most players said that the ecosystem did not uh, did not uh, exist in India and that's not true really you know the ecosystem yeah. uh, the ecosystem did exist in a way uh, you know we as the market leaders Ola uh, we created a lot of the ecosystem here uh, I remember three years back when we were planning for the scooter there were not many motor manufacturers or uh, you know uh, battery manufacturers and we decided that we are going to invest in uh, a lot of these technologies. Today, uh, uh, we make our own batteries. We, we started, well, we made our own batteries from day one. It's only the cells that we've been importing. But in a few months' time, that will also change. Uh, motor manufacturing, well, we are setting up our own motor line and the new generation of Ola S1 Pro carries uh, an Ola motor. Uh, but uh, even if I was to buy a motor outside today, there are multiple suppliers who are more than willing to offer competitive prices. So the ecosystem does exist. It's just that uh, productionizing a scooter and uh, you know uh, is is quite a difficult. It's quite you know you need to put a lot of skin in the game to actually yeah. production a scooter or a motorcycle. And actually, that's you know I, a lot. I talk to a lot of startups, and uh, you know I always tell them that uh, you know. You have a scooter or a motorcycle idea, great. That's one percent of the job done. You got you made a prototype. That's five percent of the job done. The rest ninety five percent is now raising enough capital to productionize that and and yeah. do the entire game. You know that's where the real game is really. You know. Yeah. So capital cost is the biggest challenge. Raising capital it, is the biggest challenge. Yeah. It is a big challenge. It is a. Yeah. Big what challenge. can the government do to help the industry in this? Any anything on your wish list? I wish they would uh, they would reward the the real technology developers more significantly. Like you know, base the reward on how many IPs I'm creating, how much capacity I'm setting, um, what uh, you know, uh, what volumes I'm driving. I think if, you know, that would you know, if there was more linkage there. Uh, but as of now, I think uh, uh, the government is doing a decently good job with Fame Two, and uh, you know, when whenever Fame Three gets announced, you know. Expect, expect uh, it to be uh, continuing the same way. Yeah. Do you foresee a future where you might uh, buy batteries from Tesla? Uh, no. Uh, supplying batteries to someone, maybe that may be a future for the electric. Remember, we are setting up a gigafactory, uh, which will uh, come online in about six months' time. So, uh, yeah, we hope to. That's, a, that's going to be a 100 gigawatt hour factory. Uh, so yeah, the ambition should be the other way around. We have got no ambition yeah. of sourcing batteries from someone. I love the spirit. Elon, if you're listening, Ola is going to take you on in India. Don't take it easy. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. I mean, th I think that that really is, uh, is reflective of uh, the spirit, not only at Ola, but across uh, India and across the uh, Indian manufacturing ecosystem. There's a, there's a lot of... Uh, Will to just take on some of the biggest players in the world and just not not just roll over and let them have their way. And I think that's that's brilliant um, for this entire ecosystem, the entire AV market in India. Because at the end of the day, it's the consumer who benefits the most from all of this. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's let's turn our focus a bit and um, talk about the uh, raw material supply chain because you can't you can't make uh, bricks without clay. You can't make batteries without raw materials. Um, we've spoken about China's dominance over um, over the raw materials and critical mineral supply chains. How can Indian players disrupt this? I think uh, Indian players are at par with global players in terms of the, the common problems we face. And uh, I think globally, the common problem is that China really has a big control on uh, the EV supply chain. Uh, in terms of, and when I say EV supply chain, I'm not talking of semiconductors or uh, you know uh, uh, any other components, just the cell and the raw materials for the cell that is important. I think everywhere else uh, is fine, really. So yeah, I, I mean, break... if you take if you take cobalt, the, sorry, the, to interrupt, but if you take just cobalt, the the cathode material, I mean, the Mac, I mean, more than fifty percent comes from DRC, and China has long had massive presence in uh, cobalt mining in uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, it's is there an opportunity you think for um, either the government or big players, maybe like the Tatas or Mahindras or even Ola? like you, to go out and just secure mines, secure the raw material supply chain? Well, uh, I won't comment on what we are doing or what the competition is doing, because I think everyone is at very decent stage there. Uh, but when you start manufacturing cells at a large at a large capacity, raw material and uh, let's say guaranteeing the raw material at the back end is, is very, very important. And you, know, you don't want any geopolitical risks to... Uh, hamper your raw material production. More than geopolitical risk, or what is at risk is that China itself has an insatiable uh, appetite for electric vehicles. Uh, are they producing enough to uh, to supply the world? That could be the big question in the future. You know, suddenly the electric uh, uh, cell demand has gone up significantly. And even if you're manufacturing your own cell, the, the raw material demand would be very high at all times. So, uh, you would need to insulate yourself from uh, commodity hardening that happens in these uh, in these cases. You know, it's a, it's a demand and supply situation. Uh, one of the areas that R and D is focused on is that can uh, and, and when I say R and D is not all R and D is like the global R and D at various mm -hmm. places is to develop chemistries that need less of the other material like cobalt and nickel and uh, manganese. Uh, you know, uh, can be developed chemistry which need less of them and more cheaper, you know, materials like iron, for example. Uh, the other other is uh, area is that uh, you know uh, is more more geopolitical. That uh, where is the lithium deposits? I think India did announce a couple of uh, uh, places where lithium deposits have been found. Now, from finding to actually exploiting and eventually excavating those deposits. Uh, is normally a three to five year cycle so uh, you know maybe it yeah. would be time for the eventual ev boom that starts in india uh and uh you know uh, that that it is uh you know once you have the commodity being sourced locally it just gives more assurance to the local players uh so yeah it's uh, I, th I think it's going to be a mix of both really you know do uh, you think the indian government can do something to support the onshoring of these uh critical mineral supply chains, or at least the processing of them. I mean, it is a polluting industry, and which is why China has a stranglehold over it. But do you think the Indian government could do something to onshore these processes? I think uh, any mining uh, is polluting in some way. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a believer when, when you have 1.4 billion people in the country, it is very difficult to take a morally right way of uh, you know non polluting all the time and maintaining real growth what you can do the best is to uh, democratize pollution and uh, you know not limit it to just the last cities spread it across as much as you can uh, try to absorb it as much as uh, it is possible through enhanced tree cover so i i'm not in the favor of escaping uh, mining or escaping the 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 uh, uh, the processing of these raw materials that is something that's a difficult path that we have to follow and uh, try to uh, uh, try to solve that problem through technologically advances but uh, i think onshoring that is uh, is definitely something that india should be looking at as much as possible 
One of the other areas is that if China has made relationships with uh, these raw material processing countries, uh, yeah. I'm sure there's enough uh, of these around uh, where India can also be a good partner. Yeah, and the, and the government is best placed to uh, to lead in this uh, endeavor. Absolutely, and I think everyone everything moves in in uh, you know linked to each other. If uh, today India has a you know, relatively small market in terms of the battery being used. You know, if yeah. I multiply the the number of uh, vehicles with the uh, the size of the battery, then you know how many gigawatt hour we are putting on the road every uh, every month or every year. That may be very small as compared to China, but uh, if India is growing fast and the uh, EV adoption is fast enough, then that uh, that uh, that number would go up significantly. And uh, yeah. normally, you know, as you have seen the case with Tesla or iPhone manufacturing, normally. Uh, manufacturing follows the market and that's what will happen yeah. Yeah. I, I like the way the page that you said uh, relatively small ev market i mean 2.3 million vehicles <laughs> it's relatively small people forget how big the indian market really is it's massive yes yes it is massive and uh, the potential for evs is massive and let's yeah. put it this way uh, I was just trying to be absolute that you know uh, uh, 70 kilo uh, yeah 70 uh, kilowatt hour Tesla battery multiplied by the number of Teslas is yeah. much bigger than, uh, say, uh, 500, half a million scooters multiplied by three kilowatt hours. So, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, another very important uh, part of this entire EV ecosystem and the future growth of it is charging, charging infrastructure. Today, it's, it's pretty evident that at least for the majority of cars, it's maybe exceptions are there in fleets ev fleets for the vast majority you still have to charge your car at home uh, or if you can find another place at office uh, that allows you to charge uh, at your workplace ev infrastructure uh, for charging and charging at scale and even maybe the superchargers that's something that india desperately needs i think uh, the only player so far has been um, Ether, and they claim to be the uh, largest EV two-wheeler fast charging network. But that's also just 1,400 fast chargers uh, across the country. And that's a very big country we're talking about, Dipesh. Yeah. Where do you see um, fast chargers and EV charging infrastructure growth coming from? Is it government-led? Is it uh, private uh, industry led where do you see this i think the government uh, can do its bit and it is doing its bit by uh, supporting the fast charging networks uh, in their own way but the actual uh, push has to come from the private sector you know again uh, you know, it uh, it really depends on the form factor in in evs uh, you, know, you cannot be 100% wrong or right uh, it all depends on you know horses for courses kind of equation here so if I have a scooter, you know, as I quoted earlier, that you are only doing about 35 kilometers. So if my battery yeah. gives you a range of 150, you don't need a fast charge support really. You know, you come back and you put your uh, two wheeler on fast uh, on on your home charger, and the scooter charges from five ampere. So it's the normal uh, kitchen plug that can charge a scooter. Some people face the challenge, especially those li living in high rise apartments, that how do I get the line down to where my scooter is parked? But that's a one time challenge, really. And most of yeah. the. Yeah. Uh, and I personally uh, face that challenge with my, with my E2 Plus in 2017. But yes. Yeah. But again, it's a, it's a one time challenge. You know, once you have found a solution, the solution stays. It's not a daily challenge that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I use my Nexon EV and I drive about 40 to 50 kilometers a day and uh, the EV normally gives a usable range of about 200 kilometers. Hmm. Again, I don't charge it every day, but uh, you know, as with my mobile phone, I'm in the habit of putting things on charge every night. And that's hmm. what I've been doing with uh, my EV as well. So it's more of a lifestyle thing than anything else. Yeah, fast charging is needed. I wanted to take a trip from Bangalore to Goa in my Nexon and I spent a day researching and uh, and then finally I gave up I did not drive in my EV to that place because it actually needed me to stop two times uh, for charging overnight 
Not overnight. These were fast charges. So it would okay. have been about a one hour charge. Okay. okay. One hour, again, is significant enough. Uh, when at the petrol pump, you're used to doing three minute pit stops. So uh, three minute and one hour is pretty big. And uh, what is, you know, right now, I would say, I'm, I'm not blaming anyone for that, but I think we are in the teething stages right now. We are we're learning as we go. But uh, what is worrying is that where the fast charges were, that's not where I would normally stop for my breakfast or lunch or, you know. Right, second, right, right. Integration of facilities like the Western world has done is that even with petrol pumps is that you got a lot of services around that. Right. From from a Starbucks to a restaurant to, you know, to, right. uh, to uh, washrooms and even overnight stay rooms. You right. find a lot of things across, uh, you know, around the petrol pump in the Western world, uh, yeah. especially on the motorways. I think we are yet to reach that point. Uh, and uh, but you see that you see that model being hugely successful in India. That is the only way to go. That is the mm. only way to go because it, you know it's uh, it's yeah. It's carry on. Sorry, carry on. Because battery technology would take time to evolve to a point where you can do fifteen minute fast charging or uh, let's say three minute mm. fast. Charging. That is still quite a distance away, especially when you're talking of a twenty lakh rupees EV. Mm. So uh, I think uh, integration of these services at one point, or let's say proper planning of routes with these services, I think that would make a lot of sense. Right now, uh, from what I understand is that any charging uh, station supplier or a charging network created in the private sector, they have to grapple with a lot of permits. Uh, they have to find the real estate. They have to create uh, uh, you know, space. Uh, for the charger and then the, this back end, you know, remember every charger would need its own uh, uh, transmission. Yeah. Uh, at the back, uh, which would need a, basically a transformer and you eventually you're dependent on state electricity. If the electricity is not being supplied, then you're charging electric cars from a diesel generator and that's not a future we want. It's not viable as well yeah. in the long term. Uh, it's funny you say that, you know, because um, we have something called the Tesla supercharging network. And all of these uh, that you just points that you just mentioned uh, are something that Tesla has already been dealing with in one form or another uh, across the world, whether it is um, building the technology in-house, vertical integration, building these superchargers at scale, um, finding the location for these superchargers, not only uh, in continental Europe, America, China, across the world, really. Um, and also, ironic that you that you um, touched upon the need for value-added services at uh, charging stations like restaurants and restrooms and stuff, because that's exactly what Tesla plans to do. So, in India, is the supercharging network, supercharging infrastructure, the obvious low-hanging fruit for Tesla? I think. Uh... I'm not part of Tesla strategy, really, so I cannot comment there. But uh, uh, that is uh, obviously a big gap that exists when it comes to four-wheeled electric mobility. I don't really see the void there for two-wheel or three wheels because uh, of the form factor. Three-wheelers have moved to something called battery swapping. So uh, because they are constantly on the move, they don't have the time to charge. Uh, often the three-wheeler is being shared by two drivers, and so it's on the move for at least... 16 to 18 hours a day. Uh, so there's not much time left for charging at all. So battery swapping is the right way to go for three wheelers. Uh, but for cars and cars in India, especially with the road networks improving, uh, uh, cars in India would be increasingly used for long distance travel. So, uh, you know, I, I see two things that will be game changing for, uh, uh, let's say, electric car mobility in India. One would be the usable range crossing 400 to 500 kilometers, and that right. would happen. Uh, mm. That would happen soon enough. It already exists in cars which are like 50 lakh and above. Mm. Uh, doesn't happen in cars which are 20 lakh, but that would start happening, and we will reach a comfortable middle point somewhere. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other would be the growth of uh, the Tesla supercharger kind of charging points. You know, I, I, as I said, you know this. Nothing wrong in the fast charges being set up in India. It's just that they're not at the right places. You know, you have to integrate the customer requirements in one place. 
I cannot be making a food stop at one and the charging stop at another place. Um, to your point where you spoke about um, the back end of these uh, superchargers and charging stations and the fact that you'd have to depend on the straight electricity providers, Tesla has its own mega packs and it also has, uh, has been setting up solar uh, capacities at some of the charging stations, plans to increase that a lot. Um, do you see that as a viable model for India where electricity dependency uh, or reliability is not always that great? Theoretically, yes, but uh, you know, and if I was to go with the Tesla model, that yeah, can you set up your own captive solar power plant to supply power to the the charging network? Uh, we're talking acres and acres of land to set up that solar park. That's a lot of real estate that Tesla would have to buy along the highway. That's expensive real estate. Okay, uh, so it's and as I said, it's theoretically very viable, but uh, there are a lot of practical uh, problems, and uh, I'm sure Tesla would already be thinking on these lines and, uh, or figuring out what to do in, in a country like India. Uh, there's also, uh, you know, most electricity uh, transmission is a state subject. Uh, so does the state allow you to run your own power grid or do you have to supply energy to the power grid and uh, what happens to failures? Remember, we are a country where uh, traffic lights fail twice a day. It doesn't happen in most of the developed world. So uh, we made things, but uh, they are not 100% foolproof. So which means that I would have to create redundancies in the system. And the redundancy in this system, again, is a big diesel generator sitting somewhere. So uh, that's not very favorable right now. Tesla developed the North American charging standard, right? Uh, is Do you see, and then Ford, GM, and the likes had to just adopt it. There was no way around because... Tesla had the, the largest uh, charging network across North America. It just made sense for the competitors to switch. Do you see that uh, something similar happening in India if Tesla does make it eventually? Well, it depends on how much money you're planning to invest in India, how fast do you see the Indian market growing. Uh, you know, India is used to buying uh, 20 lakh rupees electric SUVs with 200 kilometer range. Can you offer a significantly better product at a lower or a comparable price? Uh, as I said, you know, Tesla, beyond the 1% of India, I don't think people would be willing to pay a premium for Tesla. So, you know, the planners at Tesla would have to figure out that uh, what is the volume I can generate and then what is the investment that goes with it. It's a significant investment we're talking of uh, here. Uh, uh, in terms of setting but, up a wide-ranging supercharging network, yeah. Yeah, but also remember, uh, there may that one percent. It may just be one percent, but it's a huge number when it comes to India. A it huge number not, of vehicles. I agree completely. So, uh, you know, even with one percent, it's one and a half million right now. So yeah, so that's uh, uh, sorry, fifteen million right now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's that's uh, I would say a lot of market, but. Uh, uh, depends on you know uh, that 15 million also has uh, you know the, the car market is not that big first and then uh, second is that I've got choices you know both Hyundai and Kia are already selling top end uh, electric uh, vehicles in India and uh, if I look at their product plans for the next five years there's a lot of uh, products that are going to flood the Indian market let's put it, let's put it this way if today right and you're seeing uh, four uh, or five electric cars that I can buy in India. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Tomorrow there would be 40, and all 40 would be mainstream. I'm not even counting the, the numerous uh, luxury electric uh, cars and SUVs that would be available from the premium brands. So uh, there would be a lot of choice for the for the market. Uh, and at the same time, I equate the, the supercharger network and the connectors issue to more like your phone. As long as there is no regulation on what uh, you are supposed to use in a country, I think everyone is fine, you know, yeah. and most of the time, no one wants to be very different. You know, if uh, I remember, it's the, the fast chargers have a different, you know, so I charge my Nexon mostly at my home and I've got in, in the Nexon, you have a different fast charging port and a different slow charging port. The slow charger is what I use at home to charge from a 15 ampere socket. The fast charger I would normally use when I was to go to a fast charger. And that fast charging point is more or less standardized across the industry. So it's not something that uh, I think anyone is losing sleep over. If uh, you know, for, for years and years, Apple carried the lightning connector and uh, 
Yeah. Till it uh, switched. And they switched. And they had to because of, let's say, EU regulations. Okay. Mm. Uh, do you want a regulatory push? Yeah, maybe it made sense for you at that time because everyone else apart from Apple had moved to a new standard and they, they had sort of uniformity. So if uh, the government says that yeah, you, uh, uniformity is desirable, then yeah, definitely Tesla will, will also have to follow that way. Speaking of the government's role, do you think the government can uh, do something to incentivize the setting up of, of a charging network? Or let's just begin with better coordination between the state and the center. Better coordination, I think, you know, uh, Rodin, one of the things that I worry about is that theoretically we are now a power surplus country, uh, which means that we are generating more power than we consume. Okay, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I read that some time back. But at the same time, in any major city of India, it's it's not 24 hour unend uninterrupted quality power supply. Bangalore, uh, I read if I stay in Bangalore and a few weeks back, I read that the government is facing a power shortage. So if the government yeah. is facing a power shortage, does it mean that uh, Bangalore is just not getting enough transmission of power or what? So, so maybe we are generating more power than what we consume on a theoretical basis. On a practical basis, we are not yet uh, reached the point where you can do without uh, having redundancies uh, built into the system. So uh, that will take time. You know, we have improved as a country in terms of power. And uh, but remember, if suddenly four million cars per year start going electric. Uh, that is a huge surplus demand on the power grid, and that's something uh, that's something of a problem that even US faces. You know, to the point that they were discussing that can we create a separate grid altogether to charge mm. electric because suddenly the popularity source, and that, that's yeah. a that's that's a that's a, I would say the beauty as well as the uh, the problem with these kind of uh, technologies that the adoption is often a hockey stick curve. It starts yeah, slow. But yeah, exactly. But you, I mean, and and I think there's something like over thirty uh, electric vehicle uh, models, car models that are either in the process of launching or due to launch within the next twelve to eighteen months, which just speaks to the popularity and the growing rate at which people are adopting uh, electric cars in India. So this is going to be a major problem. Yes. Uh, remember. Uh, so. Uh, you know, if I was to go back in history, when you, you you have been an EV owner before me, when you were you had the E2O, okay, and I look at the E2O and I say that oh, it's not very impressive looking really. It doesn't look that great. It does its yeah. job well, but yeah. uh, as it was a good first step, but uh, not the car that you know if the launch today would work at all. Okay, sure, better looking cars yeah. in the in the pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think it was the only one uh, that was available back then. Exactly, and that yeah. too. That too, it came from Reva, which was then taken over by Mahindra. Exactly. Yes, so it, that was only one available, and that was mostly being purchased by people who were either very environmentally conscious or were trendsetters, uh, or had extremely short runs uh, to travel. You know, because the E two didn't have a fantastic range, really. Yeah, it had a range of about a hundred and hundred kilometers, and you could unlock ten more kilometers remotely. Great. But you know, strange, straight, strangely, the page that was more than enough for all my city commuting. And to be honest, I just I I had a Suzuki and a um, and a Toyota, and I stopped using those because the ease of use was fantastic. Absolutely right, and then I'm in the same boat. So I got uh, an ice car that I have in my garage, and that mostly stays in my garage for a very very long time because uh, my daily commute is uh, the Nexon EV. And uh, I just, uh, in, in a traffic like Bangalore, you know, one of the best things about the EV is that when I'm sitting uh, idle at a traffic light or in, I'm stuck in a traffic jam in a city like Bangalore, which has, which has, <laughs> a, which has a reputation of, let's say, mismanaged traffic, I don't feel guilty anymore that I'm polluting the environment by yeah. sitting idle in the car with the engine and the air conditioner running, you know. So that is one of the beauties of uh, electric mobility. And uh, coming back to the point, uh, I think we were discussing that uh, uh, you know what uh, uh, you know where, where do we go with, with thirty or forty yeah. cars being launched? Yeah, yeah. I think we are at the cusp of a major growth. It's a, it's a, it's going to be a shift that 
people, uh, well, some people have seen, but some people have are yet to see that, uh, as I said, it's a hockey stick curve. I think that hockey stick curve starts materializing when uh, the delta of the price, the gap of price between, uh, let's say, in my case, a Nexon EV and a Nexon uh, petrol model, uh, of the same, uh, you know, same specifications and you know, same trim levels, yeah. uh, becomes too low. So in my case, it was now two lakh rupees. So for two lakh rupees, I was able to buy two lakh rupees more. I was able to buy uh, an Exxon EV. Mm-hmm. And I, yeah. That's, yeah, that's where a lot of us start moving. So just hang on. Is this with or without subsidy? That is, uh, there is no subsidy on EVs mm. in most cities. Okay. Uh, there are income tax benefits, uh, which I did not avail of. Okay, but okay. Uh, yeah, but there are no subsidies for electric cars really uh, in most cities. Some state governments have different policies, but uh, there are no major subsidies for electric cars. Hmm. And I think that's uh, and again, uh, I'm not criticizing the government here. I'm in support of them that Fame Two was uh, much better thought of. I think it incentivized EVs at the bottom of the pyramid. That you know we want the 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 common India to start mm-hmm. adopting EV and start living with them. The eventual move would take 10, 15, 20 years, and that's fine. But we have to start moving together as a nation to proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just seems to me that, um, I mean, after everything that you've said about um, the existing power, power distribution network in India and uh, the existing charging network for EVs, it just seems to me that this is a clear low-hanging fruit for Tesla to come in and just dominate the market. If Tesla comes in, of course, that's um, we'll have to wait and see. But it does look like uh, Tesla is heading. Um, OK, let's let's look at um, economies of scale for electric fleets. There, You do have a few electric fleets um, in India. Um, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is one. There are a couple in Delhi. Uh, there is also. Um, the snap e electric fleet um, in calcutta which is of course uh, run by the brother-in-law of um, a member of my college alma mater and he was to- and he was telling me that uh, he was making money from day one so it's a viable business it's attractive people want it uh, and i think they've uh, now scaled up to about 600 vehicles in their fleet if i'm not mistaken Plus, add to the fact that the Delhi government has uh, recently in its uh, policy indicated that it's going to uh, ask uh, all these fleet uh, fleets like Ola and Uber and delivery fleets to, I think, uh, switch completely to electric by 2030 and 50% in the next three years. So it does seem like EVs for fleets is not only a viable business model existing today, but it's only set to grow and grow massively. Uh, right in, yeah, that's a very good point, really, because the uh, uh, you know, fleet business has been around for a long time. And when, when we say fleet, I'm also including uh, ride hailing services like uh, Uber right. and, uh, and uh, yeah. Well, other services and uh, uh, you know a lot of these services have moved uh, or uh, listen new smaller uh, competition has come in, in uh, with ride hailing fleets like uh, you know snappy that you just mentioned and then uh, there is blue smart in some cities and uh, there are the startups that i see around uh, what has happened is that we have reached a point in technology where there are cheaper cars like in this case you see the picture that's a tata tigo ev uh, I think for, for the fleet market, they call it Express T. Uh, it's a decently sized sedan with uh, okay, okay, uh, you know, passenger space and uh, you know enough of, of luggage space, and runs on. It does, the, yeah, it does the job. It does the job, and uh, not only does the job, it actually does the job very well. Uh, so when you're running a city, you know, city based. Uh, uh, you know, ride hailing service like you know you are not taking out station trips, then electric uh, fleet makes so much sense because your major in expense apart from driver salaries or uh, the driver incentive is uh, is the petrol cost is the fuel cost really, and uh, once that is taken care of, remember we are also living in an environment where CNG has become quite expensive. 
So there was a time when CNG was being looked as a temporary source, uh, you know, when we're moving from petrol and diesel to uh, to somewhere else. So CNG was a good stopgap arrangement. I think that that comfort has gone away. So, uh, so the only technology that I'm left with is electric, and uh, thanks to a couple of products in the market which do the job. Uh, you know, these electric vehicle fleets have uh, really taken the market. I think from a driver's point of view also, it makes sense. Uh, one of the things that uh, we don't uh, we don't realize enough and we don't uh, appreciate enough is that uh, there are no vibrations in EVs. I remember an ICE engine, if it's running at 2000 RPM with four cylinder engines, that four pistons going up and down continuously at 2000 RPM. That's a lot of vibration. No amount of rubber mounting is going to insulate you from that. You sit in the car, an ICE car, and that to uh, a value for money ICE car. I don't like using the word cheap, but I say value for money ICE car. And you sit continuously in that for eight hours, you would have body fatigue. Yeah. The EV takes away that. This is smooth running electric motor. Uh, the EV also means because of lack of vibration, you are not going to incur suspension damage, incur tire wear as you know comparable to an ICE vehicle. So uh, there's a lot of benefits that come uh, yeah. with, with the use of EVs. And uh, yeah. uh, I would say a happier driver who is now earning more money and uh, let's say better quality of life thanks to driving an EV. And so, low uh, maintenance costs, which are very important for, for fleets. Very, very low maintenance costs. You don't even have to, uh, you know, maintain it that frequently. Normally, my, my Nexon EV flashes a light at, I think, every 10,000 kilometers. And it's quite uh, quite disturbing because, frankly, they should not be servicing it at 10,000 kilometers. It doesn't need that much. And the service intervals, but but actually, the service time is actually quite short for an EV. So, uh what I mean is that the amount of time to spend in the in the workshop on the workshop, it, yeah, uh, at, the, at the workshop would be quite small. So it's the uh, it's it's a win win for all uh, right now. Uh, and if you have enough uh, fast charging points being set up in the city, and and that is very important in this case, you know, coming back to your fast charging network, I think we need fast charging network within the city as well. You know, right now. Most of the private players and the government have been focused on motorways and express ways for fast chargers, but you need right. networks in the city as well because if someone is driving a fleet of cars, uh, they're not going to be home in say 150 kilometers to charge the car. Right. You need more range, right. you know, depending on how many right. customers you want. So right. yeah. Yeah, it just seems to me that this is another um, area for disruption by Tesla. I mean, you look at the success with Hertz in uh, in Europe, um, and especially for long distance uh, ride hailing, you if you if you marry it with the low hanging fruit of uh, a supercharger network for Tesla, these two could again disrupt a very important segment of the market if Tesla comes in, even with their Model Three cars. Uh, it's uh, it's a low hanging fruit in. Uh... In the Western world, in India, it's still a big challenge. Uh, you know, going back to uh, what is the distance of travel, what is the real estate that Tesla would need, how many state governments would it have to negotiate with for for the power supply for uninterrupted power supply at discharging stations, what are the backups it would need to put in for the power? Uh, if it's solar, then how many acres of land it would need to procure or or tie up with for various solar uh, power companies? Uh, it, I let's say it's, it's, you know, it's theoretically, it's very nice. Uh, it works very beautifully in the Western world, where also it's, you know, in the early stages only. Uh, but uh, I see more challenges for it in India hmm. as of today. Uh, definitely, there is a future for that. Uh, but then I think uh, that future uh, exists for everyone. You know, uh, there are a lot of fast That's a very important point. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That future exists for everyone. And it's not as if this um, the entry of Tesla would herald the dawn of this segment of the EV market, as as we just discussed. Snappy and many others, uh, many other fleets are not only existing but flourishing. And this is where Tesla will get the fight 
from Indian exactly. uh, Indian and players. Oh, yeah. On snappy and uh, right hailing, I, I think it's a very capital conscious uh, business. You have to deploy your capital very carefully, and uh, you know the 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 express the Tata Express T is not even twenty lakh rupees. It's I think less than. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's I think less than fifteen lakh rupees. So uh, they are not even. And I have not even seen the fleet upgrading to an Exxon EV. You know, so they are, they are actually one notch lower than that. So that's even a mm. big challenge for uh, Tesla. Cool. All right. Um... Just one last uh, area of focus. I'm going to ask you to put on your mobility futurist hat now. Let's talk autonomy. Tesla's um, the global leader in real world AI. If they crack autonomy, if Tesla cracks autonomy, let's say by the end of next year, by the end of 2024, uh, and you, that coincides with Tesla's presence in India, uh, also with the Model 2. Uh, which is Tesla's soon to be unveiled, hopefully soon to be unveiled, uh, you know, mass market $25,000 car. It's about 20 lakh Indian rupees, 20, 21 lakh rupees. Is autonomy going to work in India, firstly, uh, given how chaotic Indian roads are? <laughs> Number two, um, can Tesla's FSD trading benefit from learnings on Indian roads? That's a wonderful point, uh, Radhan. So I was uh, driving to work, and normally when I'm driving to work, I listen to a podcast, uh, and I'm putting your podcast in the list now. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, and uh, you know, uh, what uh, I, I don't remember, but uh, what someone said was very interesting. Is that artificial intelligence? Uh, there's nothing artificial or intelligent about it. Okay, and I'm not against artificial intelligence. I'm a big fan. I to try to use it on a daily basis now uh, but what it actually means is that uh, this is human design system that is trying to learn through the case studies that are continuously being uh, you know fed to it by human intervention again okay or maybe right. fed automatically now okay yes. but so with and with every case study being pushed to it it learns from that and becomes more intelligent. Okay, uh, works very well on a Western road network where uh, where we have road signs and uh, uh, where everything is like defined to the point that uh, even lanes are painted and you know where to go. And it's like you know I equate often equate driving in a Western country equivalent to uh, you know. Uh, riding on a train okay you know the train cannot just take a turn off the train tracks and go anywhere it wanted it has to stick to the train tracks okay and uh, that's the equivalent being uh, pushed by the western world when you're driving around so you're continuously looking at the road signs you have to follow speed limits you have to follow the traffic movement and so it's it's very disciplined it's very nice and that speaks in the uh, let's say the the road fatalities that they have very 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 low. Okay, uh, it's 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 a perfect scenario for an autopilot to run. Okay, it's a, it's a, you know if you if I have an autonomous system that is learning from uh, roads and road signage, I think the road signage and the 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 road map would be the first I would say feeding point for the map, and after that I will start learning further. You know, so there is a lot of promise from autonomy. In India, it just becomes very, very challenging. Who is going to, uh, you know, and when I say challenging, again, you know, uh, the roads and the road conditions are are challenging, but not probably the major challenge. I think the major challenge is that uh, we do not have enough discipline on the road, and that becomes a, a challenge for any autopilot to learn. Uh, what is also worrying is that, see, India was one of the first signatories of the Vienna Convention of uh, road signage. Uh, I think that was the 1960s. We are also one of the few countries which does not follow the Vienna Convention. So, uh, uh, so, and I don't know, but uh, uh, road safety is something that is sort of pushed by, uh, pushed at the back burner by every government. Mm -hmm. uh, so putting, uh, you know, legit road signage is uh, is often a challenge. You, you get roads paved in India, but then they don't get painted. 
then there are no road signage and uh, that is challenging you know and if uh, yeah but think what, of the lacks of lives that would be that would be saved if autonomy was were a success in india i mean it just boggles the mind how much good it could do potentially and that's where i go back you know uh, to uh, one of the early questions that we had on this podcast that uh, i don't see autopilot uh, replacing the pilot in india it's is uh, i think autopilot is a very good supplement to the pilot in india can the pilot tell me uh, what's happening in the in, on the road say a kilometer down the line can a pilot tell me if there is an errant driver on the road coming from the opposite side you know breaking the rules Mm. and coming from the opposite side and uh, is a danger to everyone can the pilot inform me of that mm. uh someone was uh, so you know, augmenting the driver augmenting it it's kind of like a, an an additional layer of safety yeah that is that is i think uh, very very important i i, I was uh, i was discussing something with an industry friend and said that you know, a chinese company came out with a concept where there was a uh a quadcopter drone that comes out from under the the uh, i think the rear bumper or somewhere in the in this part of the car basically and it can fly mm-hmm. and pilot from the car and i said it would be so interesting in bangalore traffic and probably i'm at an intersection i can make the quadcopter go in a few direction and tell me right. which which road to take because frankly google maps doesn't work very well in bangalore it doesn't tell me yeah. where are the blocks and where not So, yeah, many other places in India as well. Yeah, so I think it's you know I don't want the autopilot or let's say the autopilot won't, won't be capable enough to uh, replace the pilot on Indian roads. Mm. But what it does very well is that it augments the driver and uh, supports the driver, and that would be very very helpful. Mm. Wow, uh, fascinating. Um, so, even as an augmented feature, do you then see? competitors uh, like tata motors and uh, mahindra hyundai suzuki and the likes maybe licensing that as a feature for their evs from tesla no uh, i well, i leave it to them but i just yeah. don't see a need uh, because uh, okay let's take a drone and uh, an ai system apart and okay uh, you know an autonomous system apart uh, what what is it made of okay it's made of some lidar radar and cameras okay all connected together by compute and a uh, software that runs okay uh none of that is uh, really something that exists only in the western world or is proprietary to uh, right america or tesla okay it's, absolutely is actually you know if i look at it from a very basic uh, let's say we call it first principles if i look at it on the first principles perspective uh, stripping apart an ai system reveals that it is uh, an integration of very basic technologies done beautifully mm-hmm. uh, it, and i'm not making it sound easy really it's difficult mm-hmm. but uh, it's a difficult track that everyone is working on so i'm sure hyundai is testing cars on the same principle mahindra is you know mahindra uh, has got uh, what uh, uh ads uh, sorry uh, yeah uh, 2.5 level uh, uh, autonomy on uh, some of the cars hmm. and that so- sort of is the global standard really right now uh, we have to go beyond manufacturers will go beyond but uh, as of now 2.5 is the most popular and there are many manufacturers who are capable of doing that uh, so i think everyone is working in parallel uh, and probably everyone is working in the same direction uh i just don't see any edge that one may enjoy that the other may have to license from that it's not that cutting edge really interesting interesting wow this has been such an amazing conversation with you dipesh uh, it's just so so informative and obviously uh i mean your the breadth and expanse of your uh, experience in uh, in this field has really come through uh, and i'm so so thankful for you having joined me i'm just going to pull up uh, your your linkedin profile so that uh, people can reach out to you please don't spam dipesh because he's then not going to come onto this uh, onto this podcast again but <laughs> but yes 
Thank you so much, Dipesh. It's been fantastic talking to you on Over the Horizon. And I really sincerely hope that we can have you back on because this is a story that has only just begun unfolding in India. And India is such a massive market, not just for Tesla and the Indian manufacturers, but EV manufacturers around the globe. So thank you. Thank you so much. Rodin, the pleasure was all mine. It's an interesting area. As I said, you know, I'm having fun every day. It's very exciting times and uh, it was my pleasure to be on your podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you.